had translated into Old English, and I'm going to draw a blank on some of these, I know, beads, I'm just going to call it church history, ecclesiastical history of the English people, um, Orosius's, who is a Spanish priest, it's essentially the history of the world, but it's kind of a history of the world against pagans. Kind of an updating of what St. Augustine did. Um, that's an R. Gregory the Great's pastoral care. In other words, how to be a good priest how to minister to your flock. Um, Gregory's, I think it's Gregory's, soliloquies, and the fifth one, the ecclesiastical history of Rosie. Five major works um, might be mentioned. These might be mentioned in the introduction. I don't remember correctly. If, if it comes to me, I'll write it down. Alfred had these translated because in his preface, Alfred writes, where is it? Alfred himself writes a preface to the pastoral care. Okay. He has copies of this made of the pastoral care. His copies of it made and essentially sent to all the bishops, okay, in England, because he wants he wants them to put this into practice. And in the preface, I don't remember if it's, this is in your book or not. In the preface, he talks about why he does this, and it's because learning, just general learning, sucks in England at the time. This is in the eight. 80s, probably in the 80s. And he says, you know, north of the Umber River, there's no one who understands Latin. And south of the Umber River, there's hardly anyone who understands Latin. Okay, now think of what that means. North of the Umber River, that's where Bede used to be. Mm -hmm. That's where 100 years before Alfred, yeah, 150 years, before Alfred, that was... I mean, that was the jewel of learning in Europe, All right? The so-called Dark Ages, but that's where, you know, Lindisfarne Gospels were produced in the Book of Kelvin and, and um, all that kind of stuff. And Alfred says, now, no one up there understands Latin, which means any priest that lives up there that conducts the Mass doesn't understand a word of what they're saying. And that's more than likely true. And he says, south of the Umber, hardly anyone understands Latin. And he, he's drawn a distinction between what it used to be like and what it's like now. So he set about this educational reform program. Starts scriptoria, that is monasteries, where the monk's job is to copy and produce manuscripts. Okay? Um, man, I wish I could remember what this, what this, this thing is. But, I mean... These, for, for Alfred, are essentially, these are found in the foundational works, the bedrocks for re-establishing, starting in new learning, kind of an early renaissance, for, at least during Anglo-Saxon England. Um, whether or not it works or not, he also, Alfred's the one who begins the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Um, one of the best editions of Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, Plummer, can't remember his first name. It's a two-volume, I think it's two-volume, um, but it gives all the, you know, it has a standard kind of reading, but it gives all the variations among the five complete 
manuscripts of Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, and then the partial manuscripts as well. Plummer. Yeah, Plummer, P-L-U-M-M-E-R. It's an old, it's, it's an old edition, but there have been some other ones. Um, you know, going back to the Peterborough for just for a moment, just for a moment. The only real reason, you know, scholars kind of focus on Peterborough is because it's the most complete and it goes up the latest. It goes up to the 1130s. And so its importance is it gives us the first instance of Middle English in writing. The Peterborough? Okay. Peterborough in the year 1130, it's been a while since I've taught the history of the English language, 1135, 1137, something like that, where we can see real Middle English, where you have Old English inflections dropping off, emphasis on prepositions and things like that. Okay, Beowulf. We left, we, we left off line 186. So, <laughs> couple of things, couple of themes. I want you to just kind of, or images maybe, I want you to kind of mentally keep track of. You don't have to literally, writtenly keep track of these. Because it'll try to think how to put this. I think it'll help you understand the poem better. Or let me put it this way. It'll help you understand the poem better as I understand the poem. Um, which is not at all what, you know, by any means the, the consensus perspective. Um, it's an E. The Old English word windon, W-E-N-D-A-N, means to turn or to change. Okay? I think there's a pretty big emphasis in the poem on expecting change, okay? And usually in the poem, the emphasis is on expecting change for the better. And it's closely linked to that idea of consolation, solace, comfort. Etc. Okay. Um, what is that word say about consolation? Frovra, F R O V. Uh, excuse me, F R O F R E. It's the old English word that gets translated consolation, soul, of comfort. Notice that old English word has totally dropped out of our vocabulary. We don't have anything like it today. Notice. These three are all Latin. That is, they're all come from Latin origin. Okay? We still use um, wind on in the sense of, um, oh, it's the Beatles song, The Winding Way. The winding comes from this. It's meandering. Okay? <coughs> But just this really just means to turn, to change. You could translate, you could even translate that if you wanted to, to repent. Okay, because repent implies turning. Um, for lack of a better word or phrase, providence. More specifically, the poet is going to say that several times throughout the poem, God is in control now as he always has been. Okay. A lot of scholars kind of just push that aside. Okay. I was reading, um, where, where, where was I reading that? 
Oh, I got that two volume edition of the Exeter manuscript the other day. And I immediately turned to the Wanderer because I wanted to look at, um, see one, what the commentary said about the opening lines and what the edition said. And the, the editor of that <clears throat> essentially says, and I've literally not seen this before. It's been, it was published over 20 years ago. Um, the editor of that said exactly the same thing I said in class about the R.A. Yibedith. And he translates in his commentary, the Yibedith the same as I did. Experiences, mercy. And he talks about that other translation of awaiting and longing for as coming from Mitchell and Robinson, whose names I've mentioned before. Bruce Mitchell and Bruce Mitchell and Fred Robinson, who together did an edition of Beowulf, standard edition used all throughout the United States, or used, you know, um, a lot in the United States. Uh, Mitchell wrote a two-volume book on syntax, Old English syntax, which I could never afford, if, even if I wanted to, because they're several hundred dollars. Fred Robinson, a lot of um, articles on Old English, a very, very, very good book on Beowulf called Beowulf and the a Positive Style. Little short book, it's like 150 pages. But I think it's one of the most important things ever written um, about Beowulf. But anyways, what the editor goes on, he talks about you know, how they look at certain terms and such. And I was thinking about that in relation to kind of all of this. And it's clear, to me at least, that Mitchell and Robinson are kind of like those historians who look at Bede and say, well, miracles aren't real, so therefore this didn't happen. Okay? They take an approach to Old English, specifically to things like Beowulf and the Wanderer, that because their mental mindset won't let them account for something, they have to make it early. And this is where you're getting at the dating of the poem, you know. Early date, pagan poem. So any reference to method is to a impersonal maker kind of a thing, rather than the god that the Christian poet is referring to. Because we know at least from the standpoint of how the poem is preserved in the manuscript. Whoever wrote that in the manuscript was a Christian. Okay? I'm not talking about adding Christian material and stuff in. But there is a reason why that person put it in the manuscript. If that person thought the poem was probably, <coughs> excuse me, if that person thought the poem was thoroughly pagan, odds are it wouldn't have been recorded. Not by a Christian monk, because a Christian monk would have said, this is going to lead people astray. We're not going to include it. Okay? So just kind of keep an eye on these. And, and here's where I'm getting back to page 87, line 185 and following. So if you remember, we started with line 175. In lines 175 to 188, J.R.R. Tolkien, up until at least 1980, 1990, 2000, the greatest Beowulf scholar who had lived, um, J.R.R. Tolkien argues that lines 177 to 188 are an interpolation. They are added to the poem later. Those are not original, okay? And he does that because he thinks the poem preserves an early Germanic story and that the poem is early Germanic in its dating, in its composition, that it's from 700, if not a little bit earlier than that, all right? I think these lines are kind of central. There's an awful lot in the poem that's going to come back to some of the ideas here, specifically. So, 
We're told, you know, the hope of heathens, they remembered hell, blah, 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 blah. They did not know the maker, the judge of deeds. They did not know the Lord God or how to praise him, etc. Woe unto him who must thrust his soul through wicked force in the fire's embrace. Notice, expect no comfort. Okay, so whether you're not expecting comfort or you are expecting comfort, notice either of those are a change or they imply a change. If you are expecting comfort, that means your situation now is bad. And if you're expecting comfort, you're expecting it to change. They expect no comfort, and then the poet makes clear, no way to change at all. They think life is bad now, uh, excuse me, life was bad yesterday, life is bad now, life will be bad tomorrow. Think of, think of Bede again. Think of his telling, his story of the coming of Christianity in the competing narratives, right? What did the pagan priest say? There's no change. Ultimately, chaos wins. And the Christian priest said, no, there is a change. Life's bad now, but it can't be better, okay? So, fires embrace, a lot of scholars suggest that means the Christian notion of hell. It may, it may not, okay? They expect no change, no way to change at all. It shall be well for him who can seek the Lord after his death day and find security in the Father's embrace. I think, okay, and I could be wrong, the most important word in one sense in that last two and a half lines is the word after. It shall be well for him who can, and the verb literally is seek, who can seek the Lord after his death day. What does that imply? What, let me rephrase that. What does that imply that contemporary Christianity, as an example, completely denies? That there's some like, human agency beyond death. Keep going. Um, that I just mean, like, the spirit sort of has an, an ability to do things out beyond death. Like, but be more specific death. about what. Do what things in context of this line? Still have a chance to accept God. Bingo. It's not turn or burn. You know, Baptist mentality is essentially you got to choose now because, and, and there are a lot of Protestant groups that use this in their proselytizing, you got to choose Jesus now because you don't know what's going to happen tonight. You might die in your sleep. Or you might be like one of those three students at Michigan State killed yesterday, okay? Or, you know, one of the eight wounded. You don't know when it's going to come. Turn <laughs> or burn, because if you don't turn, it's hellfire for all eternity. That is not what this speaker is saying or what this poet is saying, okay? <laughs> this poet is saying... There is an opportunity after death to seek the Lord. And there are not a lot, but there are at least a handful of fathers of the church, east and west, who suggest that that's true in some of their writings. Okay? There's a famous story, I think Bede recounts it, And I think it's about Gregory. And the Roman Emperor Trajan. It's also recounted in Dante, in the Divine Comedy. And that I don't remember all the details of the story. But for some reason, Gregory 
starts to pray for the Emperor Trajan. Trajan was a persecutor of Christians, okay? And Gregory has a vision or something of him, and Trajan, you know, appeals for his help. Trajan's in hell. He's not in Sheol, just the waiting place for the dead, you know. He's in hell, hell, burning the whole nine yards. Gregory prays for him, and prays and prays and prays and prays, and Trajan is released from hell. What is that? After death. Trajan prays because he's come to the conclusion this, this is false. That is, what I thought before was false. There is one God, one Lord, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's why he prays, you know, to or seeks Gregory's intercession or something like that. It shall be well for him who can seek the Lord after his death day. Notice, and find security in what? In the Father's embrace. Notice there's two embracings. There's the Father's embrace, or there's the fire's embrace. Which one do you want to embrace it in? It's the two narratives. Same kind of idea that was presented in Bede. Only in Bede, it's the pagan Germanic narrative. Here, it's the fire's embrace, but again, it's, that's not crystal clear that it's referring to hell, okay? This is after referring to like a purgatory? I don't really know the idea of purgatory. Purgatory is at least developed by, as, a, as an idea by 1100 or so. I'm pretty sure it's a doctrine of the church by 1200 or so um, of the Catholic Church. There's a, a lot of branches that, or there are branches in Christianity that have a, a purgative process, but not purgatory per se, okay? Uh, purgatory as a location per se, that's peculiar to, I don't mean peculiar odd, peculiar original to um, the Catholic Church, okay? So, notice when that comes, when that big long passage comes, 175 to 188, it's after Grendel, okay, and we're told, what does Hrothgar do? He sits on his butt and he whines and moans and complains because he and his people, his advisors, they don't expect any change. Well, what, what was going on before Grendel came? Everything was fine. And then one morning, it wasn't. Change. With the sorrows of that time, the son of Hafdane seethed constantly. What does it mean to seethe? Uh, like brood or something. Yeah, brood is, is close. Brood's a little tamer. Seethe is actually a term used from cooking. So they just like simmering? Close, but simmering is on a low heat. When you see the meat, you boil it. So it's roiling, bubbling, right? The wanderer at one point talked about his mind is seething. He just couldn't control everything, all right? So notice, he seethes with what? Sorrow. And in one sense, again, we're back at the wanderer. Okay? He's overcome by his sorrow. Nor could the wise hero turn aside his woe. Well, what is that an example of? To turn aside is to change. Okay? He couldn't turn aside his woe. Too great was the strife, long and loathsome, which befell that nation, violent, grim, cruel, greatest of night evils. It's kind of hard for us to put ourselves into this kind of mindset. 
So we have to try to think of a parallel, something that would be equivalent for us today to match this in order to understand Hrothgar's seething mind. So none of you were, or few of you were alive then, but you probably get the idea. Imagine 9-11 on 9-12 and 9-13 and 9-14 and for 12 years. Imagine 9-11, 2001, went to 9-11, 2013. Every day, without fail. What would we start to think after, oh, I don't know, seven or eight days, not to mention 12 years? Is it ever going to stop? Is it ever going to change? More than likely, we wouldn't. We would think this is the way things are from now on. Then from his home, the Thane of Helac. <coughs> okay. And you got a footnote. Here is not named until more than 100 lines later. Helac is his uncle and king, referred to as Clochiliacus. That's the Latin form and described as the Danish king by Gregory of Tours, it is likely that Helac was a familiar historical figure. Okay? Gregory of Tours in his Lives of the Kings of the Franks, I believe it is, uh, where Helac is mentioned and his death is given in 520. So, Thane of Helac, good man among the Geats, heard of Grindel's deeds. He was of mankind, the strongest of might in those days of his life. Strongest person alive. So what does he do? He has a ship made for him, okay? Said he's gonna seek out the war king, that is Hrothgar, over the swan's riding, that's the ocean. The, the renowned prince who's in need of men. Wise men 202 did not dissuade him at all from that journey, though he was dear to them. They encouraged his bold spirit, inspected the omens. That's kind of interesting. That's the narrator. That's the, the poet speaking, so to speak. And yet we're going to be told something just the opposite a little bit later. That the wise man and Helak begged Beowulf not to go. So you have this jarring contradiction. Okay? That's going to come quite a bit later. So we're told he chooses the boldest companions. The best he could find, as one of 15, he sought the sea wood. So 15 men are going to go on this journey, Beowulf and 14 others. He goes, they get on the boat, they go across the waves. We get a lot of descriptions of the boat, a lot of hinnings, you know, used for it and such. And they come to the shielding seashore. Line 227, they thanked God that the sea paths had been smooth for them. When from the wall the Shielding's watchman, the Coast Guard, whose duty was to watch the sea cliffs, saw them bear down the gangplank, bright shields, etc., etc., he rides his horse to them, and he shakes his strong spear and speaks the challenge. Okay? This is the guy standing up on the cliffs, just keeping watch over the Sea coast. He sees this boat come. He sees it land. Men get off, armed to the teeth. Okay. He rides down and he shakes his spear and yells. This is a warning. All right. This is his way of saying, "Stop right where you are." And he says, what are you, warriors in armor, wearing coats of mail, who have come thus sailing over the sea road in a tall ship, hither over the waves? Hither? Really? This is supposed to be a modern translation? How many people use hither in their daily speech? Mm, not many. Here <laughs> would be a better translation, I think. So what, what's he really asking? Five words, modern English. Colloquial street speech, which is not, by the way, what Beowulf is. It's not colloquial street speech. 
Any idea? Who the hell are you? Or who the are you? You know, one of those. What do you think you're doing? Landing here. This would be like a Russian sub pulling into Baltimore Harbor. He says, I've been the Sea Watch Sea Warden for a long time. Never has anybody approached like you guys have. Never more openly have there ever come shield bearers here. This is a gutsy move. I use gutsy rather than another word. By you guys. Nor have you heard any word of leave from our warriors or consent of kinsmen. We didn't invite you. What's he thinks going on? Or what might be going on in this guy's mind? I'm about to be invaded. <laughs> this is the preliminary landing force. And then he says, I've never seen a greater earl on earth than that one among you, a man in war gear, that is no mere courtier, honored only in weapons. I, I wish he hadn't used the word courtier, it's too French. Beowulf should not have French words, right? <laughs> honored only in weapons, unless his looks belie him, his noble appearance. In other words, and there's that one guy among you that, this guy is not a thane. He should have said a mere thane rather than courtier. So, what's your lineage? Why is he asking their lineage? Why not just say, who are you? Lineage is everything related to family and all goes all the way back to, who's your hall? Where's your hall? What's the tribe you're from? That's what that's really asking, okay? And he says, uh, you can't go any further until I know that. So the eldest one answers. We're men of the Geetish nation. He elects hearth companions, okay? So we're Geets. That's our lineage. And we sit it. he elects hearth meaning his table. We eat at the big table with Helak himself, all right? So we're close with the king of the Geats. And then he says, my father was well known among men, a noble commander named Ejthael. My father was well known among men. And he tells him his father's name so that if the other guy goes, huh, I've never heard of him. What will be the speaker's reply? Then you aren't much of a man. Then you haven't heard much. He's telling us. Okay? He's telling the Coast Guard what he wants the Coast Guard to think. He saw many winters before he passed away. In other words, he wasn't easily killed. Ancient from the court, nearly everyone throughout the world remembers him well. You do know him, don't you? Or are you just some little backwater peon, you know? So he says, we've come with a friendly heart. We're not here to invade. We're not here to attack. We've come seeking your Lord, the son of Haftan, guardian of his people. Be of good counsel to us. He's asking the Coast Guard, Help us. Help us speak to Hrothgar. We've got a great mission. He says, you know, we've heard about your Grindel problem. I'm a Grindel killer. I can counsel Hrothgar to 78. Advise him how, wise old king, he may overcome this fiend. Notice, wise old king. Have we been told earlier that Hrothgar is old. No, we weren't. But Beowulf is telling us he is. How he may overcome this fiend, line 280. If a change should ever come for him. A remedy, a consolation, a solace, a comfort for the evil of his afflictions and his seething cares. 
his boiling mind and heart and soul and spirit gets calmed. That's all the comfort. Or else forever afterwards a time of anguish he shall suffer. Notice, forever afterwards. That implies what? The fire's embrace. Not hellfire, but here in hell until his death. His sad necessity. While there stands in its high place the best of houses. The sad necessity will be Hrothgar having to take a seat outside the hall and watching the best of houses stand Edel, especially at night. So the watchman listens to all this and he says, a sharp shield lawyer must be a judge of both things, words and deeds. In other words, he's not just a dumb grunt. He says, a smart warrior has to be able to determine to determine what? Or to judge what? Words and deeds. Right? How do we judge whether or not, you know, a presidential candidate is good, is a good candidate? Well, if the person gets elected, you compare what the person said with what the person does. And if they don't match, unelect, you know, kind of a thing. If he would think well, I understand that to the shielding Lord, you are a friendly force. In other words, he's saying, well, and he's telling us, you know, I think you are here for good. I think you are here to help. Go forth and bear weapons and armor. I shall guard your way. In other words, you don't have to leave your weapons and armor. I'm going to let you wear everything and go to Herod. And I'll even lead you. He says, my companion, so he's not alone. See, the Coast Guard was standing up on the crest of the hill looking out of the coast, but he has a troop of soldiers with him. He says, they're going to guard your boat. Okay? So, they go off. We get a description of the kinds of armor Beowulf's men are wearing. Lines 303 and following. Scholars pre-Tolkien just, and post-Tolkien, just loved all this description. Why? Because they give us ideas of Germanic material culture. What an actual helmet looked like. Face plates, you know. Boar figures stood over gold-plated cheek guards. That is, the cheek guards, the guards that would hang down and cover the cheeks, the gold figures, the boar figures, excuse me, are probably on the top of the helmet or possibly engraved, stamped on the cheek guards. I'll post a picture of the Beowulf, of the um, Sutton Who helmet, the D2L. I haven't posted some of this stuff. I mentioned last week I would. I'll get that done tonight. Um, what else? Gleaming, fire-hearted. They guarded the lives of the grim battle-minded. The men hastened, marched together, blah, 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 till they come to the hall. Timbered, spread. Splendid, gold adorned, gold adorned may literally mean covered in gold. Okay? If it literally means that, then that is telling us something about Hrothgar's power. When he asked for help from neighboring countries, they said, yes sir, Mr. Hrothgar, how much gold do you need to plate your building? Or it could refer to gold-colored thatch, because it would have been a thatched roof, okay? The most famous building among men where the High King waited. So, the Coast Guard says, time for me to go. The Almighty Father guards you in his grace. Not a Germanic phrase at all. Odin was not known for being gracious. Safe in your journey, I go to the sea, etc. Line 320. We're told the road 
were stone paved. This is probably an anachronism. I was going to say, that's Roman. It's Roman. Romans were the only ones who constructed paved roads at this time. Okay? So it's either an anachronism in the sense that the poet, later poet, is familiar with Roman roads and describes it that way, or <coughs> it's possibly an indication of geographic lo location, which means this area cannot be anywhere north of the Rhine River, because that's as far north as the Roman roads went, unless you were in England. And the Roman roads went all the way up to uh, Hadrian's Wall, border between Scotland and pretty close to the modern border between Scotland and England. But it is telling us the poet was familiar with paved roads. Okay? Path led them in together. So we get more discussion about their shields and all that kind of stuff. And they come up to the hall. And another person stops them. 332. 333. From whence do you cover, carry those covered shields, great coats of mail, blah, blah, blah. I'm Harold and servant to Rothgar. I've never seen so many foreign men so fearless and bold. For pride, I expect, and not for exile, for greatness of heart, you have sought out. So notice what he says. You're not a bunch of deserters. You haven't been kicked out of your land. You're not here as exiles. You're here out of pride, that is. You want to do some great deed to build up your fame resume, you know. And the courageous one, who is that? Beowulf. We're not getting Beowulf name yet. He's not going to name himself until just a moment. Proud prince of the waiters. Waiters is another name for the Geats. Okay. Says, we are here like board companions. We eat at his table. Beowulf is Minama, Old English. I wish to explain my errand to the son of Hathane, the famous prince, uh, famous prince, let us in. So the guy who's guarding the door, his name is Wolfgar, and the poet tells us, a prince of the Windles, his noble character was known to many, his valor and wisdom. Now, up until 1900, when somebody would read this, they'd see a name and they'd go, Windles, who are the Windles? And they'd start doing all kinds of research, right? Some suggest that Windles might be vandal, the Vandals. But Wolfgar is named, lots of people named here. And he says, I'll tell the Hrothgar what you've requested. And then come back and give you his answer, OK? He goes inside. He finds Hrothgar. Sitting, old and gray-haired. Notice the emphasis again. With his band of earls, he went boldly, stood by the shoulder of the Danish king, knew the noble custom, and he speaks. There have arrived here over the seas, expanse, come from afar, men of Geats, chief among them the warriors call Beowulf. They bring a request, my lord, that they might be allowed to exchange words with you. Don't refuse them. Okay? He says, man, you got to see these guys. Notable indeed is that chief who has shown these soldiers, shoulder, blah, blah, soldiers the way hither. Hrothgar speaks. Now notice, we've been told at least twice now, Hrothgar is old. Old and gray. I would consider myself old and gray, I'm 61. Hrothgar's older than that. Okay? We don't know how much older exactly. We're going to find out after. Nah, I'm not going to go there yet. So, really important passage here. Look at what Hrothgar says. Kind of 846. We are never going to finish this poem. <laughs> I knew him when he was nothing but a boy. Okay? 
I knew Beowulf when he was a boy. Give me the age. Give me an age range. For how old Beowulf was you when Hrothgar knew him? Three to five. Three to five. Anybody else? Eight to ten. Why not? Fifteen to twenty. <laughs> that could mean some of you in here are just barely, you know, men. I think this might be a little young. That's more toddler, but, you know, let's go with that. Somewhere between three to ten. All right? <clears throat> We're going to find out in a few pages. Okay, Grindel came, Grindel's been coming for how long? 12 years. Beowulf wasn't there for any of his 12 years, right? So we know Beowulf's at least 12 years old. Okay? It's probably a little bit more. We're going to find out Hrothgar ruled for 50 years before Grindel came. So that's at least 62 years. How old was Hrothgar when he became king? When he became king and commanded a large troop of warriors. He wasn't five, he wasn't ten. At bare minimum, let's say, 18. That makes him at least 80 at this point. Okay? I knew him when he was a boy, so... Hrothgar is now at least 80. Grindel's been coming for the last 12 years. So he would have known Beowulf sometime in the previous 50 years. We don't know when. We don't know from what I just read, not anything else. We don't know when in his reign he knew Beowulf. I knew him when he was nothing but a boy. His old father was called Edgethow, to whom Hrothgar the Gate gave in marriage his only daughter. Okay, cool. Now his daring son has come here, sought a loyal friend. Seafarers, in truth, have said to me, those who brought to the Gates gifts and money as thanks, that is, tribute, That he has 30 men strength, strong in battle, in his hand grip. So it's Hrothgar who tells us that Beowulf has the strength of 30 men in each hand. Holy God, in his grace. The Old English, 380. Well, do we know how Beowulf is right now? Not yet. Hina, him, holy God, for our stone, for graces or mercies, sent to us to the West Dance. Thos itch win haba. Okay? Holy God, in his grace, has guided him to us, to the West Dance, as I would hope, or as I think, or as I expect. When Lisa translates Wena as hope, that adds an extra dimension. Because it could be just as I think, ween, W-E-E-N. It's an archaic word. It's still used sometimes in writing, okay? Or as I think, as I expect. Notice, thinking and hoping, two different things. Expecting and hoping, two different things. Because you can expect bad stuff to happen. You don't generally hope for bad stuff to happen, okay? To this good man I shall offer treasures for his true daring. Be hasty now, bid them enter, etc., etc. Okay? So, Hrothgar's told us, I knew Beowulf when he was a boy. We don't know when that was. It's going to come up a little bit later. So, Wolfgar goes back, tells Beowulf and the boys, you know, he knows you. 
Notice, he says he knows your ancestry. He doesn't say, Beowulf, he remembers you. And notice, Beowulf never told the Coast Guard or Wolfgar, I'll use Tolkienian language, I know Hrothgar from of old. <laughs> okay. And Hrothgar mentions Beowulf's father, but he doesn't say anything about Beowulf's father. He doesn't know how, he doesn't say how he knows Babel's father. That's going to come up later. So, he says, go on in. Um, but before you do, take off all your armor. Swords, shields, knives, battle axes, lay them all out here. Why? Threat? Keep going. Yeah. A bunch of high testosterone, spirited men, a lot of beer, things get out of hand, okay? And there are Norse tales, and there's one that is an analog of Beowulf. It's a story of both bar Bjarki, okay? You don't have to know that. And the guy has similar characteristics to Beowulf, okay? Where there's a party going on in a hall, and it gets out of hand, Mine's bigger than yours, I'm stronger than you, and everybody slaughters each other, except for both of our Bjarki, who kind of stays out of it, because if he were to get in, everybody would be dead. Beowulf's going to say later on in the poem, I never drunkenly slew hearth companions, or, that's one translation, or I never slew my drunken hearth companions. Very different reading. So, Beowulf and his men go in. And Beowulf says, wearing still his coat of armor, not steel like 14th century knight, but a mail shirt. They don't have to take that off. They take off their shields, because a shield can be used for a weapon. I mean, you can decapitate with a shield if it's made out of steel. But Actual weapons and shields are laid aside. And he says, 407, be well, Hrothgar. I am Helix Kinsman, young retainer. Notice, Helix Kinsman and young retainer. In my youth, I have done glorious deeds. So he says, I'm his young retainer, and in my youth I did. Well, when somebody says something like, in my youth, what does that generally imply? I'm no longer a youth. Yeah, I'm not a youngin anymore. But maybe he's suggesting compared to Helak, I'm young. Could be. In my youth, I've done many glorious deeds, right? Hrothgar's already told us that. Or he's alluded because of the stories he's heard about Beowulf from the seafarers who have brought him tribute. This business with Grindel, blah, 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 blah. So he says, line 415, my own people advised me, the best warriors, the wisest men, that I should, Lord Hrothgar, seek you out. Go back for a second. 202, wise men did not dissuade him at all from that journey, though he was dear to them. Wise men did not dissuade. Does that mean they encouraged him? Or did they just kind of take a neutral stand? Here he says, they encouraged me to come. Again, later on in the poem, that's going to be the exact opposite of what is said. Okay? So he says, uh, because they knew the might of my strength, they themselves had seen the blood stain from battle, blah, blah, blah. And he gives kind of a brief prissy of his monster fighting prowess. Line 420. They had seen me, bloodstained from battle, come from the fight when I captured five, that is, five giants, slew a tribe of giants. Or I, I kind of think the captured five means he captured five giants and wiped out the rest of them. Slew a tribe of, 
What nice Latinate word do we have for that? Genocide. <laughs> That's when you wipe out a genus. Okay? So Beowulf's a genocidal killer. Okay. <laughs> His words, not mine. Heroic. Heroic. Because they're mon they're what? They're monsters. They're giants. They're not human. More than human, I guess. Um, so he goes on. Slew a tribe of giants and on the salt waves fought sea monsters by night, survived that tight spot, avenged the waiter's affliction, they asked for trouble, that is, they attacked us, just, you know, self defense. And now with Grendel, that monstrous beast, I shall buy myself. So the other 14 are eye candy for the, the women in the hall, you know. They're a bunch of Chris Hemsworth just standing off on the sidelines. I shall by myself have a word or two with that giant. How's that for a blank -sy move, you know? <laughs> We're going to have a talk, Grendel and I, you know? He's going to be like Joe Biden, you know? I'm going to take him out behind the bleachers and have a talk with him. So. From you now, I wish to request I just one favor. What's his favor? Let me do this. Please, let me do this. Don't refuse us, okay? That I might alone. Does your text read, oh, my own band of earls? Wow, that's a typo. Should be or, I'm pretty sure that I might alone or my own band of earls and this hardy troop cleanse her out. Okay, he says, I've heard Grendel doesn't use weapons, so I won't use weapons either. Now, what did the wanderer say about boasting? You better know where your heart's gonna be when you have to fulfill that boast. So he says, I won't use a weapon. Why? So that he like may be glad of me. Notice what Beowulf is saying. The glory won't be his. It'll be he likes. Why? Lord Thane relationship. Everything a Thane does in service of his Lord speaks to, adds to his Lord's glory. Guess what? The same idea applies today in the business world. If you're an underling and you do a great job, it makes your boss look better. And when your boss looks better, the boss above looks kindly on that boss and on you. Bonus, raise. It's the same mentality. So he says, I will grapple with the fiend and fight for life foe against foe. Let him put his faith in the Lord's judgment whom death takes. That's a proverb. Let him whom death takes put his faith in the Lord's judgment. What's, I almost said Grendel, what's Beowulf saying? It's up to God. There's the providence idea. Notice what he's saying, by the way. God might take me, or he might take Grendel. You have to have faith, what? For death. I expect that if he is allowed to win, that is Grendel, he'll eat unafraid, the folk in the gates in the war hall. Okay, Beowulf's men are hearing this. They're, they're around him, and they're probably going, uh, what was that? If you die, we're the you know, main course. As he has often done, the host of the Hrethmen, your men. He says, you'll have no need to cover my head. That is, you won't need to bury me, because there'll be nothing to bury. He will have it, gorgy, blood-stained, if death buries me away. He'll take his kill, blah, blah, blah. If I should die, what does he want sent to Helak? Uh, 
his mail coat. Why? It is Revel heirloom, the work of Wayland. Wayland the Smith, Germanic god. This this is the equivalent of Vulcan, Roman, Hephaistos, Greek. Okay? Beowulf is telling us this mail shirt that I'm wearing, made by a god. Kind of an heirloom. You don't want to just bury it. Weird always goes as it must. What will be, will be. Okay? And then Hrothgar speaks. This is going to get back, I think, to all this kind of stuff and how old is Beowulf. For past favors, my friend Beowulf, and for old deeds, you have sought us out. Wait, what did Beowulf say they came for? To cleanse her out of Grindel. We heard stories that the greatest of all halls has an infestation, you know, and we're the supernatural de-infestators. What does Hrothgar say? No, 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 no. You are here for past favors and old deeds. That is, you're here, Beowulf, because you owe me. We don't know what he owes him for yet. Your father struck up the greatest of feuds. Marker. All of this comes because of this. The change, the consolation, providence, feud is at the heart of all of that. He says, your father struck up the greatest of feuds when he killed Hethelaf by his own hand among the wildings. Okay? <coughs> Meaning, Hethelaf is a wilving, son of wolf. Great name, by the way. Son of wolf. And your father killed him he the laugh. Among the wildings can mean you guys are all wildings. He's he the laugh. I killed he the laugh. Or you're all wildings and I killed you all and he was he the laugh among you. Okay? It can mean either of those. So your father started that feud. In a feud culture, feud society, how do you end the feud? You don't pay up or be killed. Yes to the second, no to the first. There is no pay up. There's, there's no wear guild in the feud system. Another way of looking at the feud system is the honor system in cultures. Um, I don't even, I hate to even suggest this as a possibility, but I'm going to throw it out there. How long has the feud between Arabs and Israelis been going on? Fucking ever. <laughs> Almost, not quite. Abraham. Isaac, Ishmael. Ishmael, the son begotten by the concubine. Hagar, Sarah's maid. And then Sarah gets pregnant with Isaac, and she says, kick the whore and her son out. Get rid of them. Arabs. That's where the Arab nation populace comes from. They acknowledge that. Ish, uh, Isaac, Jews. That's it. <laughs> and they've been hammer and tongs ever since. Okay? So... When the waiter tribe would not harbor him for fear of war, that is, when Ejtheow's own people wouldn't back him because they feared the coming war. Because what's the war going to be between? It's not just going to be between 
the other wildings in Edgedale, it's going to be the other wildings in Edgedale and the people behind Edgedale, the waiter nation. So what do they do? They kicked him out. He became an exile. Thence he sought the South Dane people over the billowing seas, the honor shieldings. That is Hrothgar. So, Edgethel sought out Hrothgar because of the feud he began with the Wilvings. Then I first ruled the Danish folk and held in my youth this grand kingdom. Now, what did Hrothgar first say when he's told about Beowulf? I knew him when he was a boy. He just said he knew Edgethel from when he started this feud. When? Back at the beginning of his reign. So did Edgedale come with his wife and child? No, she didn't have them. Or did he not have them at that point? We were told earlier, Preble gave his daughter to Edgedale in marriage. It's highly unlikely that Preble would have given his daughter in marriage to an exile. A man without a home, so to speak. So it's more than likely, or it's more likely, that when Edgethel had to leave the land of the waiters, waiters is just another name for the geats, or gates, however you want to pronounce the name, that he took his wife and child with him. Which means Beowulf's how old? 40 ish. Let's say Beowulf was 10. 40 ish? Oh, no. 50 years is how long Hrothgar reigned. So if it happened when, you know, at the beginning, and Beowulf was 10, so 10 plus, add 45, 55, oh, plus 12. Beowulf's bare minimum, he's at least 60, folks. I mean, well, <laughs> at least this. That's if you're assuming he becomes king at 18. I honestly think that's a little young, probably more like 25 or 30. So 87 to 100. So would that does that mean that I mean does that mean Beowulf was like like 110 when he killed the dragon or fought the dragon? No one has written, there's not been a single article written about Beowulf's age, which I find amazing, because everything else has been written about. Beowulf's interiority or lack of interiority, does Beowulf really think, you know, all kinds of stuff about that. I think this is important because it gets at one of the aspects of the poem that a lot of critics don't seemingly want to address. And that is its fantastic exactly its fantastic element. There was an article written several years ago, late 80s, early 90s, on I can't remember the phrase that was used, but it was essentially the demarvelizing of Beowulf, removing the marvelous element. Right? Trying to make the world more real. Get, all the, get rid of all the stupid, miraculous kind of stuff. The only problem is you do that and what do you end up with? Beowulf, Hrothgar, no monsters. I mean, if you're going to remove the monsters, if you're going to remove the miraculous supernatural stuff, you don't have a Grendel, you don't have Grendel's mother, you don't have the dragon. You're not left with much kind of like Thomas Jefferson's New Testament, remove all the miracles. And the Gospels become a pamphlet rather than what they are, okay? So, 
Then I first ruled the Danish folk and held in my youth this grand kingdom, city of treasure and heroes. Then Harogar, remember I had up here the other day the genealogy? Harogar, his brother, was dead. My older brother, unliving, half Dane's firstborn, he was better than I. Kind of implies he did become king young, which is why I say, you know, it's possible. Because his older brother might have been one, two, three years older than him died in a military expedition or something. We don't know. Later, I settled that feud. Later. That doesn't mean, you know, two weeks after Edgedale arrived. It implies a passage, I think a significant passage of time, at least a year. So he's saying, I paid <coughs> Hrothgar's weird guilt. I paid the money for his having killed Peter. Okay? When I said, you know, that you couldn't buy off the feud, that's, I mean, feud between nations. Because, you know, how much do you pay? <laughs> for a single person, it's a feasible thing. He says, I brought peace between Edgethal and the Wildings. All right? I sent to the wolvings over the crest of the waves, ancient treasures. He swore oaths to me. Who's the he? Edgedale, Beowulf's father. He swore oaths to me. He made promises to me. So, Hrothgar pays the word guild. Edgedale swears an oath of loyalty and support. Is he, by saying he swore oaths to me, is he saying that Edgedale like, joined Hrothgar's so therefore, Baelor should technically take a part of his home? Um, not necessarily the latter part. That in terms of that Beowulf should be one of his retainers. But what he's getting at is, you owe me. I saved your father's, you know what? You owe me. That's why you're here. So that's the sense of like genealogical disloyalty, maybe? Um, because your father didn't keep up with his oaths. Well, except we don't know that. Oh. That's re that's an assumption you're making. I mean, uh, he swore oaths to me just means he swore something. We don't know what the oaths were. It's implied loyalty. He will serve. Well, by his IOU, like the repayment rather of the IOU, is, is it not implying that his father never takes recompense for the oath that he made? It's not, I'm not sure it's so much that, so much as maybe nothing occurred in Hrothgar's reign when Edgetal was alive. Oh, okay. So he that had he could that. repay okay. something of that severe a debt. Yes and no. I think merely being in his service, mm -hmm. whether there was a battle or not, fulfilled his debt, so to speak. But I think what Hrothgar is doing with this little speech is he's turning the tables. You know, Beowulf said, we came how? Why? Out of the nobility of our hearts, the goodness of our hearts, we came to solve your Grendel problem. Hrothgar is saying, let's see, he's thinking, if I accept this, then what? I owe him. I will be in his debt. And so he's going, see, this is why I'm old and wise, and he's just a young whippersnapper, you know, with brawn. I'm going to outthink him. <laughs> so he's doing some reputation building again? Then his reputation might was shattered. Yes, and to some extent, but he's also undercutting Beowulf and trying to put Beowulf in his debt. See, if Beowulf defeats Grindel, Hrothgar's in Beowulf's debt. He owes him. He's saying, no, 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 no. You owe me because I saved your father. You, it's almost like he's saying, you wouldn't be alive if it weren't for me. So, he goes on. He swore oath to me. It is a sorrow to my very soul to say to any man what Grendel has done to me, humiliated Herod with his hateful thoughts, his sudden attacks. My whole troop, my warriors are decimated Weird has swept them away into Grendel's terror. Like, what could I do? 
Fate brought Grindel in. Sure, fate may have brought Grindel in, but you still sat on your butt and acted like a coward. Okay. We come back to this for a moment. Hey, he could be old. He could be old, man. <laughs> when Grindel came, which was after 50 years of reigning, and however old he was, let's, let's see, he was 30 when he became king. That means when he was 80 years old, Grindel started coming. And now he's 92. So 80 years old. Pick up my sword. So at the crux of the story, we get a comparison between the clock size age and Beowulf. Bingo. In one of the most important articles written about Beowulf, got to get the right author. Can't remember his first name. Sapientiae et fortitudo as controlling theme or metaphor. I think it's theme of Babel. Um, I think it's E. R. E. Kasky. Robert Bob Kasky. Uh, written in sometime between late 60s and mid 80s. I want to say mid 80s. Sapientiae, Latin for wisdom, fortitudo, Latin for strength. And what Kasky argues is that in Beowulf, we see figures who are wise, and we see figures who are strong, and we see, see figures who are wise but not strong, or strong but not wise, and we see one figure who's wise and strong. Hrothgar is an example of sapientiae when we see him for the most part, okay? Earlier in his reign, he has both of these characteristics, but we don't actually see that in the poem, all right? Um, Helak, his name may be translated lack thought, okay? Not a lot of this, <laughs> but a lot of this. Why? Because he's a giant. He's gonna have a lot of strength. <clears throat> There's going to be a character named Haramode who will come up, who's an image of the bad king. All right? A lot of this, none of this. Beowulf combines them both. He's got wisdom and strength. Okay? So, God, notice what Hrothgar says next. God might easily put an end to the deeds of this man enemy. God is able. 478. God, Eathamai, Thona, Dovsham, and Dada Yatwaban. God easily may or is able. That scathe deeder. Almost what, literally what that means, or that terrible, you know, deed doer, um, stop. That implies a turn or change, right? It also implies God's providence. It also tells us for 12 years, what? He kind of chose not to. He kind of chose not to. Wonder why. Bingo. And it's like Hrothgar never sits down with his wise counselors who go back to the heathen temples, you know, all that kind of stuff. They never go, well, maybe this is a scourge from God. And if it is a scourge from God, because they haven't read the Old Testament, they don't know the Old Testament, they can't go, well, every time the Old Testament Jews fall away from God, God sends a destroyer to whip them into shape and bring them back, OK? 
Okay. Slavery, you know, there's the remnant, but, you know, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Philistines, they're all, they're all judgments. The Hebrews have fallen away. God sends a ravager, a judger, brings them back. So, often men have boasted drunk with beer, officers over their cups of ale, that they would abide in the beer hall grindles, attacked with the sword of terror. Notice they boast when? When they're totally wasted, man. Okay? Then in the morning, we have to bring in the fire hoses and wash out the remains. You know, Beowulf's going to talk about their beer drinking. Almost comes across like a teetotaler. Okay? Then in the morning, we had to clean them up. I had fewer dear warriors when death took them away. That's a nice little bit of lethal tease. So, take a seat, Beowulf. Drink. I mean, notice exactly what he says. Drink mead in my hall. And he probably brings him a big old tanker, you know. The reward of victory as your mood urges. The bench is cleared in the beer hall. Poet emphasizes for the men of the geats altogether. They all sit down, etc. Then there's joy of heroes. No small gathering of, deans, of Danes and geats. Or Danes and geats, whatever. And then we get introduced to Unfrid. Which is kind of interesting that Leusa puts this name. Why? Because the manuscript doesn't have this name. The manuscript has this name. Every time he's mentioned, it is spelled. H-U-N-F-E-R-F. Hunferf. Every time. Okay? Yet, the one time where the manuscript reads Beowulf, and all scholars assume it should really read Baal, Leuze uses this, what the manuscript reads. And yet, every time it reads this, he uses what nearly all scholars say should be this. Because of alliteration. Okay? When you have a name, that name is going to be the alliterate, the beginning of that name is going to be the alliterative uh, syllable in that line. So we get introduced to Unferth and we don't have time to say anything. So, we'll stop there. Um, and we'll pick up way behind with Unferth on Thursday.